Anonymous, Anonymous Poem Cold food day is near, rain has made the grass grow lush. Barley shoots sway in a breeze, green willows line the dike. We both have homes, but cannot yet return. Cuckoo, stop repeating those words in my ear. So, this is the last heptasyllabic quatrain in this collection. And it's an anonymous poem. Uh, I think we've already encountered this trend. And sometimes the last poem in a block tends to be an anonymous poem with a folksy type of um, subject matter or character. And this poem is no exception. So we can't say anything about the author here. So what's the topic of the poem? Well, the topic of the poem, it's a seasonal poem set in spring. More specifically, a festival is mentioned from the beginning, the cold food day. And uh, in, because of, 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 of especially the last line, you could also say that it's also a separation poem, a poem lamenting the, the, the fact that the poetic persona, whoever he or she is, is probably far away from home. So I think we've encountered Cold Food Day in previous poems of this collection, but just to just to refresh your memory. So Cold Food Day was a traditional Chinese festival. It's not much celebrated today, I believe. And it was basically, a, I think it started as a midwinter festivity of commemoration, probably of the, of, of, of the lengthening of the days again, like our, our Christmas. Uh, then it got moved into spring, into late spring, I think, probably the, the, the fifth month. And uh, it, it, basically the, the, the only ritual, or, or the main ritual rather, of, of that day, and it was always an informal festivity, not that much a state-sponsored festival, is uh, the taboo from eating um, cooked uh, foods. You can't light a fire during the cold foods festival. And... Uh, Later, I think it became associated with another festival that takes place a few days later, Qingming, which has also appeared in, in this collection, which is a festival of homaging the dead. And uh, I think in Chang'an it was also the occasion for a uh, bright spectacle of night lights and, uh, and, and a breaking of the nightly curfew that generally was implemented in the capital. Anyway, so Cold Food Festival, the idea is that it's in spring, in late spring, and uh, you can't light fires. But besides from that, I don't think there are many elements in the poem that move around um, the, the, the idea of the cold food festival. So let's take a look at the poem. Uh, it's a quatrain, so you know it's difficult to say that it has any sections or parts. But you could say the first couplet is separated from the second couplet. And that, as usual in these cases, the first couplet is more like descriptive and objectivist and generic. Um, so it, it presents us... The, the, the chronotope, it says, you know, cold food day is near, rain has made the grass grow lush, barley shoots sway in a breeze, green willows line the dike. So, cold food day is near, so it's uh, late spring, yeah, we're approaching this festival. You could say almost that the reference to the cold food day is just for pointing the season and for nothing else. And then we get three elements in nature, rain, Sorry, there are three plants mm, that, that are growing in spring and, and comments are made on them. It's grass, it's barley and it's willows. And they are all associated with early spring. Not with early spring, sorry, with spring. So there's grass. What happens to the grass? It's growing lush. Well, it makes sense. So in spring, all the grasses grow. Probably this imagery of the grass is already evoking the theme of the last line homesickness and separation because it's a very common trope in classical Chinese poetry when it talks about spring grass growing long um, for this spring grass to be symbolizing um, the, the dist in, in, in its length and in its growth uh, the distance from loved ones or from friends and also the road where the traveler goes where he sees the grass growing long and also it's a metaphor for the long road that separates a person from his home or from his beloved. So the grass is growing well. The barley shoots sway in the breeze. So um, in this case, I, I, I am not aware of what the reference may be. This is a spring image. Of course, barley is green, it's a grass. And in spring, you know, you have the barley 
uh, growing up and being swayed by the wind. Uh, wind is generally uh, the persuasive power in poetry. And it's also used a lot as a symbol of wind. The character wind is used as, as you know, for, for persuasion and for rhetorical abilities to persuade or to move people. So maybe there's this element of the moving of the feelings equated with this wind that moves the barley. And uh, the last image, willows line the dike. This is also a typical spring image, but it's very interesting. Willows are generally associated with parting from beloved ones. It was a, it was a custom in, in ancient China when you separated from a friend or a lover, you know, to give them uh, a sprig of, uh, of, of green willow. And if, if the parting was in spring, of course, so, so they become symbols of separation. But more specifically, this image of the green willows lining the dike Think connects with one at least of the 19 old poems, which are you know very very ancient, the oldest type of pentasyllabic Chinese verse, which is the direct ancestor of the of the Xi poetry in this in this volume, and uh, that poem of, of, of if I remember one of the 19 poems I think talks about green willows in the dike, and it's about separation, mm, like uh, it's in the poetic voice of a of a woman I think who is. Uh, lamenting that her beloved is, or her friend, I, I don't remember, it's in the other end of the world. So the first couplet, as usual, you know, very naturalistic. It, it appears to be purely descriptive, but it's not the case, because these images of spring nature, especially the green willows on the dike, quite clearly the grasses as well, perhaps, although not so clearly, the barley swaying, they're all meant to connote they're all they're meant to, arrive, to, to, to to make appear in the mind of the reader, even before one goes any longer, indirectly, obliquely, ideas of separation, loneliness in spring. And uh, the second line, the second couplet, sorry, completely goes into that line because uh, we, we, we have the, 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 the direct speech voicing out his or her feelings of the poetic persona who now speaks in the first person. We both have homes but cannot yet return. Cuckoo, stop repeating those words in my ear. So, again, there's this pathetic fallacy, which is pretty typical in Chinese poetry and in Western poetry, but in Chinese poetry it has this extra element, which is the traditional Chinese belief of the correlation between nature and humankind, macrocosm and microcosm, the interrelatedness of, of these two spheres. So, we might imagine the scene in spring, after seeing these plants, the poetic persona hears a cuckoo. Now, traditionally, a cuckoo's song is reinterpreted by, by, by the tradition as burugui, it's better to go home. So, the poet uh, is seeing those signs of spring sadness and of separation from home. He hears the cuckoo and, following this traditional interpretation, interprets the cuckoo's song as a call for going home, and, you know, and he is sad because he or she is sad because he is far from his home. And, you know, he answers the cuckoo and says, yes, yes, we both have homes, I know, but we cannot return. So it's probably a, the poetic persona is a man because they're the ones who did most of the traveling. Uh, a man on duty. So it could be any sort of man. This is an anonymous poem. Um, the persona doesn't have to be a scholar official. It could have been maybe a conscripted laborer or a soldier going uh, to serve in the frontiers. But anyway, someone whose duties have separated him from kith and kin, which is always uh, a depressing and sad melancholy topic for classical scholarly poetry. And, and not only for the classical scholarly one, also for the popular poetry, which this poem is probably evoking and imitating, even if it's not a, a, a folk poem of itself. And I think that's all we can say about the poem. So in in certain aspects, uh, very, very continuous with, with a lot of the poetry we encounter in this anthology.